And there we go. And we've got a guest with us tonight who has been to places like Minnesota where he got one of his degrees. You know, when you have someone who's got a degree from Minnesota, from Carnegie Mellon, from Georgia State, and now is up in Canada, he's been, you know, south and north, he, you know, he, he, and he's well connected. Saul, if you look at who he's co publishing with, you know, the articles, the people that, you know, that he's connected to, he'll lead us tonight into the field of HPT and corporate training and instructional design and technology and the history of ed tech and instructional design. He could tell us, he could tell us the whole history and it could be a three hour event, but we're gonna be limited to about an hour. Um, we're gonna have some Q and A with him as well at the end. Um, and it's, it can be free flowing if anyone has a question at any point in time. I've sent you his bio, I've sent you his websites, various ones, uh, and you can see he's very accomplished, but most recently he worked with me and. Chris and I on the eLearn conference as the director or the chair of the board. And something so like that. that's something like that. It's something that I did for a number of years and then Saul took over in 2017-ish. And I don't know if you still are. Um, I'm yeah. listed, but I'm not. They, I, I thought they were going to pick somebody else, but they didn't. So I don't know what's going on. Um, so yeah. So, so yeah, so it's coming up again in the fall, I'm not sure where it will be held at, but I may go to Ed Media in New York City, um, that's coming up. So AECE, the Association for the Advancement of Computing and Education, Saul and I have been very involved. They have several conferences, the Site Conference for K-12, Ed Media and eLearn for Higher Ed, and Global Learn kind of is for global <laughs> conference. Typically we built that one for Asia, but it's, it's migrated to, to Europe as well and other parts of the world. Uh, so we could we could just start with a couple questions that might be uh, career related. And since okay. Chris is only with us for for a few you know minutes, I want to let him ask the first question. It could be any question, Chris, and I'll let Jennifer ask the second one since there are little special guests here, Dr. Park and Dr. Devers. So Chris, would you like to ask something? Sure. Um, how is you how is technology in your field changed in the past 20 or 30 years and where do you see it going in the future? Probably my the short answer is not as much as a lot of people think um, in terms of what, what's happened and where do I see it going in the neck? I think that actually I see some greater change in the next 20 years than I do in the past but maybe it's because I I've been doing e-learning since 1984 um, and I was taking e-learning as early as 1980, which I know is like beyond not normal. Um, and so I was using authoring tools. I was using PCs. I, it was interesting. HTML is a version of Scribe, which I learned in 1980. Um, God, I'm dating myself. But in other words, I had access to a lot of different technologies early. And so some of the things that, I mean, there was some, th I'll never forget, there was this thing that they were showing at a conference at the early, like at the first dot-com boom, 1998. Some of you were probably barely in diapers at the time. And um, they were talking about how great it was. It's like, I saw the same thing 10 years ago at a demo at University of Georgia. And, you know, Tom Reeves and uh, Kent Gustafson were demonstrating this. And it turns out the big difference was that you could do it over the internet as opposed to just locally on your computer. And I wasn't fully appreciative of and it's, I do understand telecommunications and I should have been more appreciative of the major accomplishment that was, but it, you know, when you look right down to it, it was like, I saw this 10 years ago. Yeah, that's all I could think about. Um, so, you know, in that sense, I think probably the biggest change I've seen in the last 20 years with technology was e-learning went from something that everyone said had this amazing promise to being something ubiquitous. And we have the pandemic to thank for that. Um, and I, everyone thinks it's really amazing that, you know, we moved online so quickly in two weeks, literally two years ago, like right now. It's not amazing. The infrastructure was always there. People just didn't feel like using it. Um, everybody was fighting. Oh, we're not going to force anybody to use e-learning. So um, that's what, you know, that's what I've seen. So I, I mean, that's why I'm kind of cynical about all these great changes. I mean, author, the, um, the storyline stuff has been the dominant authoring tool for like the last decade. And before that it was like authorware until it started dying out and 
you know, between Macromedia, Adobe trying to kill it and stuff like that. But that was probably the first authoring. And then there are other ones out there, but that one's like the main one. But it's been, I mean, granted, they have new versions. They give it a new, like, sub name. But, you know, articulates, articulates, articulate. And so, I mean, even the authoring tools haven't changed that much. And you'd be surprised how much PowerPoint um, still is. But it's really interesting. I was watching this video this weekend when I was supposed to be doing something else. Because there's nothing like expanding your PowerPoint skills when you should be doing, like, research on reporting. And I learned they have this like new tool. It was new to me, at least. You can practice your presentation on your PC with nobody around but your cat, your like computer camera, and it will actually give you feedback. And I was telling my students, I was so proud of myself. I had this latest to AI. It's like, oh yeah, I use it. And it'll tell you this. I'll tell you that. It's the other. So I'm behind the times. But I think the role of AI is going to play a much bigger role. I think what PowerPoint is doing, and I'm, I have to be honest, unlike everybody else, I don't need to say death in PowerPoint. I think PowerPoint is life. I think it's amazing. Um, and I'm not joking. Um, I think it's a highly disrespected tool. Um, but I think the artificial intelligence that they're building into it, for example, um, you can do some dictation with it. Um, if you have crappy design skills, click on the design ideas tab. All of a sudden, you can be at least a reasonably half competent artist, not fully, at least half. And you know what? That's pretty good. But where I think AI is really going to like do some way cool stuff is by all the stuff it's tracking in the browser. And this is, you know, it'll have an impact elsewhere. But for me, I, I primarily focus on the training impact. And they're able to track your behavior and that they can link to skills. So if you're doing X, Y, and Z, it looks like you probably are competent in like A skill or B skill. And therefore I can start to give you credit. And I've done a lot of, you know, a lot of my research and a lot of my research currently is in the area of informal learning. And it's really hard when people are learning, you know, in bits and but, you know, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. A lot of it's unconscious. Um, to give you credit for something that you may or may not know, because we like to know that your butt and the seat were attached to each other um, when we give you credit. And then of course, to be able to do, you know, portfolio-based assessment, which everybody's been advocating for, and nobody's willing to talk honestly about the fact that it's a lot of work and nobody wants to do it. Um, and then coming up with the standards is even harder work than actually assessing the portfolio. Um, now you got AI to do all that. So we might be able to do that. And I think that's where, and then I think there's some really amazing things that can happen about that. I think there's some scary things, but right now I'm just kind of focused on the amazing things just to give people recognition of skills. Um, there could be some false positives and then there will be false negatives. In other words, people won't get credit for skills they do have and they will get credit for skills they really aren't, don't have. So I think that's something we're gonna to have to look for, but I know that's where the technology is headed. Um, there are, you know, some, and there's like kind of a refurbishment of the, uh, from the learning management system to the learning ecosystem, I think they're calling it. And where you have like this suite of tools that facilitate learning and the track learning and track behaviors that can do this. I mean, I think there are things that are happening around there. So that's kind of my short semi-cynical answer to that one. Awesome, thank you. It'll be exciting to see how AI advances some of the current things where we are. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, now I understand where Saul, how he became so productive. Uh, as I look at his bio and his vita, he was a, not only an econ major, but into writing and uh, technical writing for his master's. So he learned the writing skills before he got into this discipline. So he, you know, he took those skills and it did influence him. For me, being an accountant before made me more organized than I should be. I, I try not to be organized, as Jennifer knows, um, <laughs> but, it, but it's a good skill to have when you're trying to be a scholar in this field to organize the, the, your, your research. So I'm sure the, the writing background, especially technical writing in Minnesota, is very well known for their technical writing program. It's a top program in the field. In fact, my dissertation was influenced by a person named Lillian Bridwell, who's studying key Oh, yeah, just the writing. They, they were in a different department when I was there, but they've merged those two departments. Um, so in then, yeah. more recent years. So Tom Reynolds and I created a keystroke mapping system in, in WordPerfect and a set of and, and, and a set of prompts. And so we were following her research on keystroke mapping at the time. There's a guy named Ross, maybe, with her, but um, it's Bridwell's work and anyhow. Um, so 
before we go to Jennifer's question, which she's still thinking of, um, tell us how, how in the world you were an online learner in 1980 and 1984, and whether that was learning from Linda Harrison and, um, and other people who were in the field at the time, uh, I'm thinking on the other person's name right now, but I was doing research on collaborative writing tools in 1990, and they're much better tools, I've always often said, than what exists today, you know. So Saul's right, the tools, there's not been much change, really. What's going to happen, it's going to be dramatic. But, but tell us about the history of learning online in 1980 or 1984, and were you partially online or fully online? Who was in charge of the, the online class? All right. So when 1980, I was, I was fresh out of my undergraduate degree. And um, I went to work as a tech writer for IBM in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, I thought I was interviewing for a job in Rochester, New York. That, and, and let's not credit me with being fully awake even um, <laughs> in my job. And every day, and they wanted me, they really didn't have any work for me. They just hired me and paid me, which is a really great, it, it can be frustrating, but it was kind of nice um, to get started. I never worked. We didn't have, I had a couple of internships, but internships weren't particularly common back then. And so they just sent me to class every morning. They said, we signed you up for a series of courses to take. You took it online. You had to go to this learning center that was like a building away, which is like maybe a five minute walk. And I would sit in front of this old IBM terminal that attached to a mainframe. And I was learn. I learned uh, problem state, somehow or other day it was problem solving. I'm still not quite sure what I learned in that one. I learned about hexadecimal language. I learned a couple of other things that I don't fully remember. Um, it was all basically green screen. So it was pre, you know, pre PC. The PC wasn't even announced, I think until like towards the end of that summer. And then um, after I, I did that for, I think about four months. And then I graduated to the Heath kit AC and DC electronics courses, which are done out of a workbook. And I did that once a week on Tuesday afternoons. I was supposed to write hardware documentation. And just as I was getting trained for the system to write the hardware documentation, I said, we've switched you to software documentation. You're working on a different system. And that's, you know, that was that. And I'd worked on that project for about three and a half years and I was finished. And then they were deciding what to do with me and how to get rid of me. And so they found a job for me in manufacturing training. And manufacturing training was really interesting. It was like, we were in this really crappy office, often a trailer at the edge of the plant. Uh, and that the floor, I wasn't quite sure it was always gonna hold. Um, and we produced nothing but self-study training. We did slide sound shows. We did, they were just about to do some videos. They bought a bunch of video equipment. Um, we did workbooks and we taught people who worked on the manufacturing line. And we had a couple of students in that summer. And one of them was supposed to do e-learning as she was a student, like summer worker. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would use the word intern because we didn't really have interns at that point. And they bought IBM's then authoring system. It was $49. You could buy it any B. Dalton bookseller and I'm not exaggerating. And um, you could start an e-learning course. It was for the PC. Anyway, so I work on I came up with an idea for a course. That's fine. You can do it on the PC. So that's what I did. It wasn't the only thing. I did some slide sound shows. I wrote a couple of video scripts. Um, I mostly ended up doing workbooks for um, manufacturing lines, clean room procedures, stuff like that, which ends up, you know, for a completely disorganized and non-mechanically minded person, it was a really good, between that and learning the programming and um, telecommunication side that I learned in the previous job, really good at how to think like, in a very structured way. And it was there that I first even heard of the words instructional design. But by that point, I'd start my master's degree in tech comm. I was a part-time student for the most of it. And I was commuting from Rochester up to St. Paul. Um, and so I was really kind of interested, but when I finished my master's, I transferred to IBM in Atlanta. And that was, I worked on the PC training. And this was for the original IBM PC. Um, we had, it was a very different kind of thing. We went from a $49 authoring tool to a $2,000 per license authoring tool. And it was all, it was all tag based. So you had to know tags. I'd learned the tags my last year of um, university. Um, and then we used them all the time for marking up the text 
for the book manuals that I was writing. And I continued to use it as the primary tool when I was working in manufacturing training. So that was like no big deal to switch over to this other one. And I still maintain that's really helpful to know how to go into the code and, and muck around with it because you have controls over things that the, you know, the WYSIWYG controls just won't let you do. So I, I really like that. Um, I still go into, you know, X, you know, HTML code when I don't like something and fix it myself. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the world's best HTML coder, but when I need to know something, I can. Um, and then, so that's how I got, it was the more complex. I spent the next two and a half years doing that. And so that was how I got into e-learning. Um, when I was finishing up my master's degree, I took one course with Stan Trollope on what was then considered yeah. to be brand new, interactive video disc. Right. Um, I, 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 it would be considered to be a racket these days. Um, it was the very first, you were on these big discs. They were basically the same technology as a CD, um, but think of the size more like an old 33 RPM. Um, it only cost a mere $1,500 to master the first one, and each additional one was another $1,500. And then for good luck, you had to have, you had to pay for a license to view it on a soft system. So in addition to $1,500 for this, you know, disc, you had to pay like $50 just for the license to look at it. Um, that, that's the one thing about the technology change. It's affordable. That I, I will definitely go. Um, and what it can do for the money is really substantially improved um but Stop. those authors yeah Stan so that's Trollope. how it got that into e-learning was that minnesota stan trollop yeah that meant that one yeah. Yeah. yeah okay yeah yeah so it's the guy named ross is donald ross in the writing center um so you may I did not know of, him because yeah. i was in believe it or not i was in the department of rhetoric which was in the right. agricultural college right, right and that's on i have a master of agriculture degree not a master of arts degree okay. big so a did, little g was Ann Hill Dune there? Oh yeah, and I, I still collaborate with her right yeah. now. Okay, yeah, okay. So you know so, Ann? Personally, yeah, I have a chapter in one of her books since she was a guest in my other class a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I, I'll, we'll talk at the end of the show about yeah. Ann. She's, she's, she's survived something recently. So um, yeah, she's a good person. She's part yeah. of active learning classrooms there at, at Minnesota. So yeah. So, you know, my history is similar in working in automated systems, building circuit boards and manufacturing plants and trying to get I was in charge of training there, but I understand what you're saying. I, I help put things on a PC from a mainframe yeah. and, and, you know, physical Lotus one, two, three, you know, all that stuff. We have oh, yeah. Old names, quick, yeah. Oh yeah. So Robin Mason was the other name I was thinking. So Robin Mason and Linda Harrison taught the first fully online class at the university of Toronto in oh. 1985, where they claimed star Rex and Hiltz and her husband, Murray Turoff were at, New York Institute of Technology or something. They were working with Linda and and uh, Robin Mason. Um, I think Linda was that was her graduate. That was her doctorate, I think maybe. And she went yeah. off to Simon Fraser, as you know, and did all her. And she's she's a close personal friend. Um, who's not been on in in this class? I should invite her in sometime. Robin has passed away, um, but those were the early people. You know, people in in, in you know in in Canada. Terry Anderson and all, and all those, you know, people were the early, you know, Canada because it's such a spread out country, Australia because it's such a spread out country. Um, but anyways, it's interesting to hear kind of everyone's career and how they got going. Jennifer, you have a question for Saul. Uh, yes, I do. Kurt, like when you talked about like your undergrad and Saul's, you know, educational background, I thought, you know, I thought of two things. First, we may be soulmates, you and I, because <laughs> I was thinking about the same thing. And secondly, um, I was afraid that you're going to steal my question. <laughs> but I, the question I have for Saul is like, um, you know, Kurt and I, uh, we talked about how our undergrads really, um, the influence of our undergrad, like how it influenced like our what, what we do now in our, like for me, like, no, my direction is more on corporate training because my undergrad was in business. And, you know, like it may be a really smart part of your life if you look at it in a, you know, you know, your, your lifetime, but it's, it's, it puts a really, um, there's a big influence of that. And I was curious how like your, your educational background um, affected the research that you do and, you know, the, the projects that you um, you uh, participate in. Um, yeah, I mean, my undergraduate 
education was like a fight to get me finished. I had no interest in being there. I had no interest in going to school. I always thought I wanted to be an architect. Um, but I really didn't want to be in school. I wanted to write the great American novel. My family said, fine, here's how much rent and what have you done? You know, I have nothing to write about. So um, really supportive uh, is probably in the end just retrospective. And I will say this and then I'll come back to what I studied. When I graduated, I'll never forget. I took one last look at campus and I looked especially at the library building and I said, I never ever have to look at the inside of a classroom again. So the fact that I'm a professor of education is just absolutely like one of life's biggest jokes I ever heard. I'm not joking that it was really hard to get me through. I changed undergraduate majors every term until the beginning of my senior year. I was a major in economics, business, public policy, um, writing, and I actually briefly was going to be a major in architecture, which was no small feat because that was the only one that was competitive to get into. By the When I decided not to be an architecture major, because I wanted to take two years to finish that so I could finish up my undergraduate degree, they said no either you go into architecture and they were brutal there at Carnegie Mellon. There are, they would, you would hang. Um, it was like, really, they wanted you to hang from like a noose, but the, you had to hang your, your work and they would give you grades. And the typical grade was double minus. Um, there was, and they were just brutal in the grades and the marking it was really, really terrible. Um, so when I came back and then I finally did a, an aptitude test, which I probably should have done before. And I was about to uh, look at, I was looking at a social science major to add, you know, to, for my exploration, my tour of majors. And something occurred to me, I didn't have to keep dropping majors and starting. I had enough work that I could start to make all of my majors work for me. And I was telling a friend about this earlier. I ended up graduating with three majors and a minor, and I really would have had a fourth major had they, um, had they agreed to accept marketing for nonprofits as the marketing requirement for the business major. So that's why I only have a minor in that. I, otherwise I met all the requirements. And I'll never forget, I actually called the head of the program up and I said, you know, Marianne, that was her name, Marianne O'Nan. I said, Marianne, you know, I want you to think about my mom at the bridge table, all of her friends, kids, you know, they're gonna be doctors, they're gonna be lawyers. I'm not gonna be, but at least she can say, my kid had more majors than any of you put together. and so she said, well, wouldn't your mother love you with three majors? I said, well, to be perfectly honest, a fourth wouldn't be such a bad idea. It's just, well, you're going to have to figure out how to make it do on three. Um, I did it through a lot of double counting, but my, ma my first major was economics. My third major was public policy. My minor was administration management science, which is what they call business. And my second major was um, professional writing, which is what I made into my career at that point. But my ability to have that business sensibility and the Carnegie Mellon sensibility of you know, things like the concept of satisfying from Neil, um, I would say Neil Simon from uh, Herb Simon. Um, and the idea of how to do a policy analysis, it trained my brain in a way that suited me well for originally just for tech writing, but for more business oriented positions and take a more business oriented approach to my work. When I graduated school, um, I received a small inheritance when my grandmother died and I was going to travel someplace with it. And friends of mine had some money. And they said, why don't we go to Europe? And so we had time between the time we graduated and the time we went to Europe. We had about eight weeks and we ended up going, it was a three week trip to Europe, which one of those three week trips that just literally changes your life. And that's when I truly fell in love with museums. So that's what I studied for my dissertation. I did my dissertation. My feeling was I was going to stay in business. I was still working. Um, I said three figures, three letters by my name for four figures for the day. But my first gig as an independent was to teach. And obviously that's where I, I ended up being. But um, I was doing my dissertation. I'm doing this degree for fun. So I'm just going to study something I'm interested in. And it really introduced me to informal learning, which is what I have my grant for now. And I've done some variations on it before. But um, that I still find fascinating because the more I get into it, the more I realize nobody really understands it. And um, you have to have almost kind of like an accountant's approach. We're actually just having people log their stuff and count every, what they do. Um, then we have them, there's a lot of stuff they log, like what are you learning? And we have some general categories and we ask for like, give us tell specifically what you did. What are you gonna use it? How much time did you spend? 
Um, so we have some accounting for, I mean, it's still some self-report data, but it's pretty much at the moment of need. And a lot of people are making some really wild claims about what people can do with informal learning. The preliminary data that I'm getting, and it's not, you know, it's not ready to publish. Right now, it's looking like it's very short-term job-related stuff for something that you're going to use in the next week. And I'm not exaggerating. So when people say you were going to learn informally for the future and all that, it's a lovely thought. And maybe in a realm other than the workplace, that might be true. Because I certainly know with a lot of what I know about art and culture, I learned I'm self-taught. But I can also say that um, when it looks at the real learning, that's that. In terms of the public policy degree, that ended up being quite helpful along with student experiences. I may not have been the world's best student, but I was involved in just about every organization. And what I learned as a student leader really helped me when I went out to volunteer, aided by some of the, the refinement of my thinking that happened in the public policy degree. And so that I think allowed me to become more engaged with professional organizations in a productive manner. Ben? So what? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Kurt wants me to talk. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm. I mean, definitely. You know, like I think. Um, you know, what I really like about instructional technology is like, um, you know, it's kind of not too deep, but very, you know, broad. The topics that we explore is very broad, and because of that, um, based on your, you know, your previous experience. Um, before joining um, instructional technology, you can really apply it and make it richer and, you know, more in depth and create your own little, you know, area of expertise. And yeah, I can, I can really relate uh, with what you just said. So thank you so much. Good. Yeah. I mean, I always say like one of the nice things about the field is you can be a total dilettante. I know about everything from paper towels to, uh, you know, in-depth telecommunication security. So at really Saul, basic level. Saul, Saul mentioned Herb Simon briefly. I, I get to eat, eat a Carnegie Mellon uh, with some faculty. My first, when I worked at West Virginia University, I, I sat at the table next to Herb Simon, didn't get them personally. I, maybe I did introduce myself, but earlier in my lecture, when I was presenting, I mentioned that verbal reports as data paper by Erickson and uh, Chase and Erickson became the paper that enabled us to start understanding human cognition. Well, Chase and Erickson were at Carnegie Mellon, but they were also, uh, Herb Simon was there and they worked, three of them worked together, uh, looking at um, trying to understand um, internal mental processes by having think aloud protocols, by having people yeah. speak as they're, as they're solving a problem, as they're typing at a computer or whatever. And that's been used today quite a bit in usability testing and other, uh, other fields have extended beyond that. Um, so anyways, it's interesting that, that, you, that you mentioned him. Um, there's all these connections, all these interconnections. Yeah, well, you're talking about the Think Aloud protocols. That was something that was really popularized by the American Institute for Research, who had a project going when I was at Carnegie Mellon um, with the doc, they called the Document Design Center, and they had an office at CMU, and they had an office in Washington at AIR. And um, I, Linda Flower was really, yeah. was a really well-known writing. She friend. was my writing professor my last oh. year. She I learned more brilliant. from her about writing than anybody I've ever taken writing from. And she's also the one who did something really important. And I'm not, I don't know if I have the skill that she has in terms of doing this, but at least, you know, writing is a skill. It is not, it, it's not a talent and you just learn tricks, but you have to be willing to learn and you have to be willing to take a lot of feedback. But with that, you learn the tricks to be a really effective writer. As a, you know, a scholar, I mean, it's really important because you learn you become much more productive in writing research articles if you have tricks about how to write the methodology, how to write the results, how to write the uh, the conclusions. I have standard headings I just put it in, and I have I have a couple of little tricks that I use that I know will be guaranteed to at least get me a revise and resubmit. I mean, very rarely does it get you a uh, reject. I'm not saying that everything's perfect, but I'm just saying it's just half the job is just being complete, and it's amazing how many people just don't see what it takes to be complete in writing a research report. Now, Linda Flower created the kind of process model of writing yeah. with with Richard or Dick Hayes. Yeah. And, and he gave a speech on this campus a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, but the two of them, and then I developed my my reprocessing model of writing based on their work and, and Marlene Scardamelia's and Carl Breiter's work. I combined their two to create my my model. Anyhow, so 
brilliant people at the time, you know, writing as thinking was big. And that's, that's where, where, where the field was headed uh, to look at the impact of writing on thinking. And, uh, and there's the, the writing across the curriculum and, and other things. I mean, really the people in the area of, of, of the, the writing psychology, the psychology of writing were leading the kind of uh, field ahead a couple of steps. Anyways, we've gone, we've gone to a territory that I wasn't planning to go yeah. into. I, I know Saul's got a presentation for us, but before he clicks into the presentation, I wanna make sure that Kangwei or Sunme or Priska, Scott, Linda, well, there's a so, question yeah. on the Jamboard that's here. Oh, yeah. We've got a Jamboard question. Who's got the Jamboard question? That Priska, of course you do. Go ahead, Priska. Ask so, away. The question I had was regarding what you were saying earlier um, when you were responding to a question about AI and where uh, education and the technology there is going. Um, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the plan is in terms of, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor right now, and I really want to start integrating these kinds of platforms into my classes, but I feel like there's a lot of resistance on both ends. Um, administrators kind of are afraid of it. Prof other professors are kind of afraid of technology and the students are a little afraid of technology. So I'm wondering on your end, is there something that you guys are doing to start integrating that into uh, ed tech in terms of teaching other professors how to do that? So well, before I answer that, um, tell them where you're at and where yeah. you are a professor because he might want to do some consulting for you and you have to bring him to your location. Oh, where um, are you? I'm in Miami, um, and I teach fashion design at Miami Dade College. Oh, how cool! Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> we talk about it. Um, you know, it's interesting because I find with the technology and the ed tech, we like to. I never like the name ed tech because I feel like it's like misleading, um, because it's mostly instructional design, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I always felt like, and, and I've never been able to convince my colleagues. I mean, we do have a, a decent usability course, but that only happened because we got a new faculty member who finally understood what that course should be. And we have a, a decent tools course, but I think there needs to be like a system, kind of an overview of systems course that puts all the different stuff into perspective. Um, there's a scheme that I learned when I was at IBM about, you know, rating your competencies. And it's a five level scheme, but I'll just, the, level two to me is really important one. It's where you understand you can define something and you can describe all of its key components, even if you haven't used it. And I think for our field, when it comes to the really complex technologies, it's really easy to get you know, caught up in authoring tools. You know what, they're cheap. I mean, $2,000 is cheap. A learning management system with a $50 a head fee and you've got a thousand users, you do the arithmetic. Um, sorry, that's expensive. And we don't teach the expensive stuff. AI is expensive. And I think that's a real failing of the field. Um, so I, I, I wish we had more. We talk about it. You can go to conferences on it. That's how you learn about it, unfortunately. Or you can do an independent study course of some sort. We, we call them tutorials in our doctoral program. Um, there was independent study when I was getting my degree at Georgia State. But I mean, this basic thing is, is but um, it's a really nasty area to try to figure out because there's lots of different AI itself, when you just go to that part of the field, is broken up, you know, to various components. There's like speech recognition and like vision recognition. Um, there's machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. We are more integrated. We look at like the whole thing. Like think of it like how they've integrated AI into a lot of the office products where you have the vision is there where it does the assesses your performance at the same time. It's got speech recognition because it can take dictation and it can even take dictation in terms of like getting office to like write a memo for you. And at the same time, it takes orders that you can give by voice and it can distinguish between the orders and the dictation. That's pretty amazing. I mean, because people can't always do that right. Um, but we don't teach that. It's just something you have to pick up on your own. I'm not sure that's a great thing because I think giving people frameworks of thinking about these and what cubby hold it, because people, there's a lot of overlap. It's, and I keep coming back to the LMS space because I think it's a really complicated one um, and different pieces were developed for really different markets. And then of course they found there was more money to be made going into the opposite market. So things like Moodle that were really designed to be in higher ed 
they want to make money off of corporate. Um, and then you have things that were corporate, like um, Osaba and um, I think Desire to Learn was originally corporate. And now they want to go higher ed because there's like tons of money to be made. But they weren't designed. And I always find whenever you look at software, there's a, I have a core principle. Whatever it was designed to do originally, it does well. And everything else, it screws up. I'll give my last example, and it's a much more basic one. Office was designed to run on a PC, not a Mac. And I'm an ex-IBMer. I've been really loyal on the PC line, even after they sold the PCs to Lenovo. And all my co I work in a Mac shop. And finally, like between them and my partner, I, they finally got me to buy a Mac. And finally, after five years, I said, this, I, I, these keys are driving me crazy. I'm going to a PC. I don't care what anybody sells because PCs work better with Office than the Mac does. And I'll stand by those words. <laughs> but, it, but it means it's, you know, you have to know how things were originated. It doesn't mean they can't do what you want to do, but it always means it's kind of like, you gotta do a little zig, a little zag, but it's like, this is a straight line, so much easier. Well, that's the way it was at IU when I came using a PC and I switched to Mac to do all sorts of collaborative because it collaborative technologies on an app on a Mac were cheaper, cheaper than on a PC. Yeah. But then we didn't support, IU didn't support Max all that much. So I went back to PC. And even my last job in the corporate space, it was True Blue IBM mainframes all the way. And uh, it went out of business because it, it couldn't it couldn't switch over to PCs. I tried modeling it and showing them, but then I just gave up and went to grad school. Um, you know, Smart so move. a lot of dinosaurs out there. Um, oh, yeah. So we should probably go to your slides unless anyone has a pressing question before Saul uh, shows us the slide, uh, presentation he has. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Okay. Great. I'm going to share screen. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the ID HPT history. Um, I'm just going to go to a, uh, I'm going to skip forward. I've had some, I didn't know what we were going to be doing. So I made up, I was prepared for all kinds of eventualities. So I'm going to just starting the, um, with HPT, talk a little bit about what it is. I don't know how much you've studied. Maybe someone could tell me how much have you studied about HPT, human performance technology? So the readings for this week say history, trends, and issues in HPT. That's week 12. Okay. Last week it says human performance technology concepts and process models. So week 11, week 12. So um, you have two weeks worth of knowledge. Yeah. Well, they, okay. they haven't done the readings for this week yet. They might have done last week's, but not this week's yet. All right. So I'm going to give you the, like, the really the 50,000 foot above earth, um, probably 10 minute version of it. So... Um, Seeing training as the role, the role of training groups as improving performance has dominated the field since the mid 1990s when ASTD, which is now ATD, adopted the performance paradigm. And um, so let me talk a little bit about that. Human performance technology, which is the original name for the approach, posits that many training um, programs will not address the many requests for training. Um, and there are a number of different sources that will back that one up. Um, and that says HPT proposes they're really, and, and there are different versions of this. This is the one that I learned first, and I just find it, everything else is more complicated than this. So I like this one. There are three reasons why people perform that affect performance, three issues. Skills and knowledge. Do performers have the skills they need to perform as desired? Two, resources. Do performers have the tools they need to perform as desired. And motivation, do they want to perform as desired? And I'll give you an example. Imagine you're trying to lose weight. So there are some skills and knowledge that you need because you have to be able to make healthier food choices. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, a Dairy Queen Blizzard or a nice healthy apple. Which one are you going to eat? So to know what to make, you know, so you, to make an informed choice, there are some skills and knowledge. So this training will address the skills and knowledge. But let's say you are in a food desert and the only thing there is Dairy Queen. There are no apples and Dairy Queen doesn't sell its fruit fresh. It's been pickled, whatever they do to it and they shove it inside ice cream and stir it up. So the question is, do you have access to the resources that you need? If you don't have access to healthy food, this is why health, food deserts are such a problem for healthy eating because people don't have, you can't eat healthy if you have no healthy food nearby. You can eat worse. I mean, you can eat a whole bag of Fritos or a half a bag of Fritos. 
but I can't begin to tell you a half a bag of Fritos as tasty as they are. And they're really tasty. Um, unfortunately, they're not any healthier than a whole bag. I mean, they're, it's just less unhealthy. It's not that they're healthy. But imagine you've gotten access to that delicious apple, but you've also got like the opportunity to go for a blizzard and you've had a really crappy day. And food is your go-to thing. You're not into drugs, you're not into alcohol, you're not into cannabis, you're into, you eat. Well, if you're in a crappy mood, you know, I have to be honest, a blizzard can be really great comfort in a moment of need. So, you know, that's so you have to look at what's driving people. Give you a more businessy oriented one. A classmate of mine, when I was going for my PhD, was doing a project at a bank. And their, their tellers were, how do I put this, rude. And so they're like, why are you rude? Do they know how to be polite? Well, it turns out they knew how to be polite. But for what they were being paid, which was 25 cents less than the tellers at the bank on the other side of the street, they weren't going to be that nice because they weren't, they did were treated badly and they were going to share the joy. Um, and guess what? They, so my clients, my, my, co my um, classmates said, you know, I could teach that. It's going to be a waste of money. You could spend the same amount of money and give everybody a 25 cent an hour raise and you'd probably end up with the same result. And that's what they did. And for a time, they were happier and they were nicer. Um, so that's really, in a nut, a really simple nutshell, what the core concept is in terms of the three resources. But there's another piece that's really super important. Performance happens at different levels of the organization. And the original concept for performance, when they started using the word, it was at the individual, can live, people perform the skills? But as people went deeper, they started realizing one of the reasons that people are performing so badly is because this place is screwed up. Um, and where the question is, where are they screwed up? At the unit level, the organizational level? Um, and then uh, Roger Kaufman's contribution was at the societal level. By the way, organizations have more levels than this, but it's just kind of simple to keep it this basic. Um, and then Rumler and Brace, one of their great contributions was like, it ends up when someone points this out, like, well, duh. But someone has to point, at least for me, or apparently I can't notice what's in front of my eyes. Um, performance that was my lecture all... last night, was the duh findings of research on social media. <laughs> I kept saying, duh, somebody, someone had to do it, you know? <laughs> exactly. Someone said social science research is the confirmation of the merely obvious. But um, someone has to do it. But performance problems often happen in the, what's called the white space between levels or between groups. So there's work that has to be handed off from person A to person B or group A to group B. And if you don't really define how the work gets handed off and what the quality of the work needs to be, whatever I give you is what you get and you may or may not like it. Um, and when you really don't like it, you can watch out Judge Judy and see how people really are unhappy. But um, if you can just get people together to define what needs, what is the state, the quality of the work that needs to be passed? And what is the protocol for passing it? It makes things a whole lot easier and simpler. It's not fun to come up with those protocols, but things run so much more smoothly when you've got them in place. And so you can train into, I mean, maybe there's some training that ultimately has to happen um, for how to perform the protocol or how to verify that things are the right level. But negotiating that protocol is what's really going to make the difference in performing in the performance improvement there. And that'll affect the entire organization because if someone if one group is sending bad parts to the next group, should they continue manufacturing something they know isn't gonna work? Probably not. So NSPI, which is now ISPI, adopted this framework in the 1980s. And I joined NSPI and that's what used to be called the National Society for Perform. They're originally the National Society for Programmed Instruction which was really the basis for the e-learning that I took and the Heath kit training that I took. Um, apparently it felt, I actually think it's really cool how they do it. And it's very effective teaching, but it's very anal in its approach. It's very detailed in how you did the task analysis and it fell way, way, way out of favor. So programmed instructions were kind of like not very appropriate words to be using anywhere. So they quickly became performance and instruction and, but they adopted the performance framework in the 1980s. Um, and they also define, they published a series, and I'll talk in a moment about some of the um, ecosystem they developed, but they published this thing called the Handbook of Human Performance Technology. This is from one of the earlier editions. There are ultimately three versions of it. Um, James Pershing from Purdue, so another Indianan, um, actually did, was the editor of the last version. 
And there's more stuff that they in this book, but I pulled out the ones that really focus on the HPT process, um, which is sits above and be above and more expansively than the traditional needs assessment process for training, or I should say for instructional design. And then there's a whole section and it precedes the one on what they call instructional interventions, because they really want to emphasize the non-instructional nature. And so it's organization design, corporate culture, feedback on um, compensation systems, job aids, which I, I would have put in training, but you know, everybody can organize things their own way. And then job design, which was a real hot topic in the eighties, you know, where you could design things out of people. And it's a, actually, it's a really interesting intervention. Why make people do things that they don't do well? Why not find ways of letting, especially writing, everybody hates writing except for me. And even I hate it on some days. And so why not templatize it to make people's lives easy? Um, so, so, so can you go back to that slide? Yeah. So I'll point out that in, in, in your syllabus, uh, I had Alison Rosett, who's the first one listed as a guest last semester, and she's listed the video with her. She's fascinating. She's always highly opinionated, oh, yeah. um, but very fascinating to listen to. Uh, and then also last week we had Tiagi as a guest. He's listed third from the bottom or fourth from the bottom is Tiagi's work when uh, designing compensation systems to motivate performance. Work. I assume that's Silver Salon Tijarajaran. That's, that's the Tiagi. Oh, yeah, guy. no, that's definitely, yeah. yeah. There are very so, few people could properly pronounce his name. <laughs> um, but then some other people I'll point out there, Lynn Carney, who's retired now, um, she was out in San Francisco. She was an independent. Steve Villachica and uh, Deborah Stone, they worked together in Denver. Steve is now a professor at Boise State. Um, Mark Rosenberg recently retired, but he oh. had a very distinguished career. Um, right. He edited that first section. And Dale Brethauer, I think he was at Mich one of the Michigan schools. Um, he did the non-instructional thing. And then Seth Liebler and Ann Parkman, they ran a center. They were ex-CDC employees who ended up form forming their own company. They did a lot of CDC related stuff, but they also bought the rights to the Bob Mager books. So they were, for years, they published that. Um, so people might books. not know CDC, that's Control Data Corp. There are many- No, no, it was the other CDC, the oh. one that you hear about every day with the coronavirus. They were oh, in, they're from Atlanta. Yeah. Centers oh, for Disease easy. Control, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, yeah, yeah, I forgot, okay. I had, and then John Keller, of course, for motivation. Um, right. The John Keller who does the ARCS model. So they, right. I mean, there was like a lot of the really, I mean, and Diane Dormant who wrote one of the chapters on implementing uh, HPT. Diane was a teacher. She was a president all of, all uh, time. and Roger yeah. Addison is still sort of kind of active. Yeah. Most of these people have retired, but a few of them are still around working. Mm. Um, anyway, several NSBIers became active in ASTD and they influence this direction. And ASCD, and this is part of the problem with terminology in our field, they called its approach human performance improvement. And they swear up and down that there is some distinction between HPT and HPI. I have yet to be able to figure it out. And when you ask them privately, now nah, they're the same thing. Um, it's, it's market differentiation, um, which right. we see, to, and I know that people will split hairs over the, between educational technology and instructional technology. That may be splitting hairs within the field to the outside naked eye. That is something that that's probably not a really productive distinction um, because it doesn't mean anything to anybody. This is my terminology background from tech writing speaking. These concepts have also influenced researchers at the Academy of Human Resource Development. But I think what's noteworthy is the Academy never adopted performance improvement as its guiding paradigm. And it's part of it because there is a, and this is something that I, it's funny because I haven't done a, a thorough research on it, but I've gone through old issues of ASTD's magazine called, then it was called Training and Development, now it's just called TD, uh, so that it's kind of vague about what it really refers to. And there was a battle going on in the 70s and the early 80s um, for the soul of the field between the educational technologists and the scientific approach and the adult educators and what the more humanistic approach. And when ASTD adopted, they were actually advocating, they used to call it the field human resource development in the magazine. But when they adopted the performance paradigm, that was kind of the death knell of the adult ed um, field in terms of its influence over this. Part of the issue is a lot of the adult ed, while they focus on this, much, much of the work in adult ed is actually in adult basic education. It's dealing with liter basic literacy for either people who didn't learn it when they were in school because of deficient schools or people who are second language learners immigrated as adults and have a very limited English vocabulary. 
getting back to the HPT, there was an ecosystem that emerged once that happened, you know, once the adoption happened and it becomes mainstream. You see systematic processes that are at ISPI and ASTD have published and encouraged people to use. Robinson and Robinson published their book, The Performance Consultant. And after that, everybody wanted to be a performance consultant. Or maybe I'm slightly exaggerating. Um, there were various certificate programs from groups like ISPI and ASCD and from private providers like Lakewood, which does the training conferences. And I will be honest, I've had commercial relationships with ASCD and Lakewood. Um, certifications have existed from ISPI. A this is kind of a little weirdo. ISPI certification, ASCD was a partner on, but then they launched their own certification in 2006. It's actually built on a different training certification that arrived in the mid 1990s from a company called Chauncey and Associates, which you probably never heard of, but you probably have heard of their parent organization, the Educational Testing Service, which is the grant, you know, home of the SAT, GRE, GMAT, and all of your other favorite standardized tests. Um, this was their for-profit corporate arm, um, and they thought they had a case for certifying trainers. It turned out they really didn't. You see the journal performance improvement quarterly also arise. Um, what distinguishes HPT is, and is central to our field, is the systems approach, and that performance occurs within a system, and the training only will deal with part of that system. The other thing to note is that, that we're looking at systems, but we take a systematic approach. It's not like, you know, I, I looked at this today because it would just seem kind of cool. It's like, I look at this first, I look at this second, I look at this third, I look at this fourth. And you can change the order around, but you're looking at everything kind of in a very similar way, in a systematic way, so that the process can be recreated and you can um, see if you get the results replicated. But the emphasis, it's very interesting, the HPT, well, I'd say the philosophy still guides us on a, you know, you know, on a kind of a theoretical level. The performance is waning right now in light of worker shortages and skills. It's interesting, I was working on a paper where I was going to talk, actually the one I'm presenting at AHRD, is our work job skills development or is it performance improvement? And I was going to go, and I actually wanted to go to the mission statements of all the different training groups to show that they were all focused on performance improvement. And lo and behold, they have all changed their mission statements to focus on skills. And that's not surprising um, because there's a fair amount of evidence that even when we were adopting the performance paradigm, the majority of the work was in training. Um, I actually have no problem being a trainer. I'm super proud of it. And I use the T word, not the L word, because learners do the learning. I don't do that. I facilitate learning and I do that through training. I have no problem saying I'm a trainer. I think it's something to be incredibly proud of. Um, I actually have an article that never got published uh, because someone thought it was distasteful, but it's called internalized trainophobia. And what I do is I begin by taking a bunch of things that people said about training, but I change it to one of the, uh, a group that we would never use it for. I said, if you wouldn't use it for them, why do we use it to refer to ourselves? It's horrible things that we say about ourselves. There's no reason oh. to be anything but proud of being a trainer. So Saul, I'll stop you for a second because it is an important point that you kind of jumped into there. There's a person in the field named Elliot Maisie who has a had a conference yeah. called Learning, and you know he changed from training conferences to calling them Learning in all his newsletters. And there are other people too that have emphasized the learning side and not the training side. So it's an issue in the field that's arisen during the past two decades, actually, especially yeah. the last decade. Um, and, and I think the problem is, is that Elliot needed to use the word learning because he was um, forbidden from using the word training for commercial reasons oh, right. because He's of so, non-compete contracts. Right. Elliot's an interesting character. We're not going to talk yeah. about him. Um, <laughs> but people should look him up. You should look him up. Yeah. I will just say this. Long before webcasting was something that people did for funerals, he made sure his mother's funeral was webcast. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, and I'm not exaggerating on that one. Um, I think the wrapped up in this is also the HRD concept or human resource development, which, and it, it's really funny because I'm looking at this and it's like, you know what, HPT, when they're looking at the interventions, it's a different way of thinking about it. But when you look at the interventions, training and development, career development and organization development, they're still central to the work of um, human resource development. I think what happens though is everybody thinks they're a lot more aligned than they really are. 
my most recent book I wrote with someone who was a career development specialist, I can guarantee you she's not in the, her world is so completely different than our training world, completely training, completely different. So I think, you know, we should know each other, we should work together, um, but it is a different world for sure. And I think that's about all I have for this, the HPT stuff. Um, so I'll stop sharing for now. So, so, you know, be, so, so uh, the first couple of slides looked interesting to me, actually. You have some definitional I'll go back and I'll ones. put them back up, yeah, okay? Put them back up. I'd like, like to see what you had prepared there, if that's possible, because I think it's, 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 it's terminology you're going through, I think. Oh, yeah. So I, I, here's what I was working up to. I was working up to a, I was going to ask you all these multiple choice questions. And then um, I had this big timeline for you. That's good. Oh, perfect. Yeah, do that. Yeah. All right. So let's just see. Which came first, A, B, or C? Put in, the, put in the chat window which one you think came first. A, yeah, B, put in the C. chat. Which one do you think came first? Got a B. We've got a, an A. Got an we A. Yes, an A's. A's. We have a B. A. Okay. Okay, we got one B. And, uh, yeah, okay. Next one. Which was the first major e-learning authoring tool? Uh, I have mentioned it. Maybe I mentioned it in my other class. So, um, and I've got the book on it too. I love your certainty, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one. How much time elapsed between Kirkpatrick's dissertation on the four levels and the book from Barrett Kohler? How much time elapsed on the Kirkpatrick between his dissertation and the book explaining? Yeah, wow. because and the reason it's significant, I will say this. The four levels was his dissertation. Yeah, it was. I think he was in the Korean War. Yeah, and he came back from the Korean War. He's from Elm Grove, Wisconsin. I grew up next to it in West Dallas, Wisconsin, just a mile away. Um, and I had a chance to meet his son at a conference in Singapore, we're still using the model, extending it out all over. Oh yeah, so, I'll talk about that one in a second. Yeah. All right, the first competency model of the field was published by which of these organizations? Okay. Krissa, I love your certainty too. Um, and this is a question where normally you say, if you don't know what it is, you answer B, but I would say I wouldn't answer B. <laughs> okay. And then which one was the first one to, or uh, this one I gave you away, so I'm not going to ask this one. Oh, no, do ask it, do ask it. Go I'll ask back. it, see if you were listening. Yeah, yeah. See if you were listening. Yeah. So which organization was the first to adopt human performance technology as guiding philosophy? No one's going to answer because they're going to, oh, he's going to pick on me. Um, we've got everything else. Okay. There was somebody yeah. answered each one of them right, but a lot of people answered some of them wrong. So let me, uh, we'll go through. This is a really simple. Um, Bob Reeser, Robert Reeser published a, uh, a two part history in, it's still the definitive history. Within decades, I have not, chrono these are not chronological, but that stuff is generally right chronologically. Pre World War II, um, People were using film strips um, and quick printing, and then it meant mimeograph. And what was really cool about the mimeograph, which you probably never heard of, it was a machine that went round and round, so that was kind of fun. And it had this really great smell. You could get like really high off of it. I used to yeah. love the mimeograph machine. It made your hands purple though. Oh yeah, it was, it was an ink heavy machine. It was, it was disgusting in terms of cleanliness, but it did the job of doing things quickly. And, and by the two. way, we're using Reeser's book. And so they've read, they may have read okay. the article. So this is good. This is good review. Yeah. So World War II, you probably know, um, the American Institutes for Research, which is really fundamental for both of my disciplines, both the uh, instructional design and technical communication, because all of the founding concepts were based on research that was done there. You also see in the 40s, ASTD was founded as the American Society for Training Directors. Um, and believe it or not, the Society for Technical Communication, I was shocked to learn this one, was actually a split off of ASTD. It's not, it was the one of the first. There are more to come. Um, a predecessor at the Educational Technology and Research and Development actually launches in the 40s. I went back and checked their volumes. 
And Canadian Society for Training and Development was founded as the Ontario Society for Training and Development. 1950, um, 1950s, actually 1959, Kirkpatrick publishes his famous four levels. It's interesting, a couple things about that. First, it wasn't his. Um, Will um, Tallheimer discovered that actually it was a guy named Raymond Kurtzell who, Kitzel, who actually came up with it. So I always teach it as Kitzel Kirkpatrick. The other thing though, this is an important lesson to learn. The only person on the face of the earth who turned his dis dissertation into a retirement career. He actually did nothing with the four levels while he was working, especially with supervisory training for management. He was active and that's what he looked at. He didn't talk about the four levels. And then people started getting interested in them. And so he, that's why it took 35 years. The book was published in 94. Then he went on a road trip around the world until he died. And then he started a consulting business, which his son really you know, cultivated. And his son still has the business today. Um, so that's how that happened. Xerox copiers, really important. And TV Magazine, um, which was training development magazine that launches in the late 50s. In the 60s, we have programmed instruction, which is a particular, very, very structured approach to instruction in really small steps. Um, Maker Six Pack, which if you've never read it, is the best book on writing objectives, writing assessments, and clarifying your objectives and goals I have ever read. And it's written like almost at a first grade reading level, but it's, it's deceptively simple and it's super readable and they're, they're just amazing. Um, the first computer-based training courses emerge in the late 60s. Training magazine launches. British Journal of Educational Technology launches. I don't think this came up in um, Bob's article. The uh, BJET, the British Journal of Educational Technology launches. Cold type, which is how we type, print mostly everything today in offset printing, which significantly reduced the cost of printing and ease because you just took a picture of everything and made a plate out of that instead of having to set every single letter one letter at a time. It killed professions, um, but at the same time, it made printing really, really cheap. Um, and then we have the rise of the overhead projector, which is an ancient machine for you guys, but um, was really central to us. The 70s and 80s are super important to us in our field because there's a lot of developments going on. You have the first instructional design textbooks from Smith and Reagan and um, Dick and Carey. Now Dick Carey and Carey, because um, one of the Car Carey's sons there. Thomas Gilbert publishes Human Competence, which is really the, the manifesto for human performance technology. Um, the first is Ontario Society for Training and Development launched the first competency model. It's in 1976, and it's called the CAT. ASTD launches theirs, I think it's 79. Um, and Pat McLagan, who was still active in ASTD, is the one who came up with it. And we see Scribe, which is one of the first word processors emerge. And it's a tag based and the tags are very similar to the ones used in HTML today. Gagne, it's not that he did his research then, but he starts publishing his book. Big, a lot of really big books get published in the 80s. Gagne's um, Conditions of Instruction, Knowles and his adult education book, um, Rossett and um, Alison Rossett's book on needs assessment, I think job aids, and Joe Harless's book on front end analysis, which is another term for needs ass assessment, they all get published. ISPI perform launches the performance paradigm towards the end of the decade, performance improvement quarterly, the journal that you probably read is there. The IBM SIRS, um, PC launches, and we have the first authoring tools, Bookmaster um, and WordPerfect. Bookmaster being a tag-based word processor, WordPerfect being I always thought it was word like annoy me, but um, it was the first WYSIWYG word processor that achieved any scale. My dissertation. <laughs> and I wrote to word perfect people with my prompts and ideas and they for K-12 and they said, we, we, we're, we get the adult market nailed down. We don't need to worry about <laughs> K-12. And they went out of business about two years later. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And like word, there's a ton of stuff that happens in the 1990s. There's the divorce of the acad academic the academics from the ASTD. That's how the Academy of Human Resource Development was founded. And there was actually an alimony payment. I, that's why I, they're my words, not theirs. Um, because ASTD funded um, Human Resource Development Quarterly, which also launches at this time for the first 16 years. Um, huge. Rumler and Braish published their book on needs assessment. Um, 
Robinson Robinson published their performance consulting book, which is a follow up to their book called Training for Impact, which is talking about the financial impact of training. You see the first impact handbook of human performance technology published, human resource development quarterly is published, NSPI renames itself the International Society for Performance Instruction, authorware. It's developed by the same guy who developed Plato, which was the very first authoring tool, a guy named Michael Allen. What is really noteworthy about Michael Allen is that he is an he is an e-learning designer. He is extraordinaire, yeah. who happens to understand the technology well enough to create an authoring tool. Authorware was like the first WYSIWYG word um, authoring tool. It wasn't cheap, but it was easy. You did not need to be a programmer to use it, and it becomes a huge hit. Um, Michael Allen sells it to Macromedia, and he continues to this day to run a, um, Allen Interactions, which is um, an instructional design firm, and they do really high-end, really beautiful custom e-learning. Little side um, note there, Saul, you, you run the e-learn conference, and I think you brought him in as the keynote in Las Vegas a few years ago. Um, I tried he, to, at least. I know He was He's, there as the keynote. Um, okay. Yeah, so he, he did come. And, and Marty Siegel, a professor at IU, worked for Plato beforehand and worked for Authorware uh, and worked for Microsoft's. And I brought him in as a guest a year ago in my other class. So yeah, there's some connections here to all of this stuff. Um, oh yeah, it all yeah. kind of comes together. Yeah. Then you've yeah. got e-learning. I would say e-learning goes gaga because e-learning had been around like at this point for 30 years. But with the advent of the internet, all of a sudden people discovered it as if it had never been there before. Right. Um, and, it's, and it's called the next killer app. It only took the, um, a pandemic 20 years to make it a total killer app. But there's some caveats on that one. Um, the certified technical trainer, which is the first certification for trainers, comes out. This is written by, uh, it's by the for-profit arm of um, the educational testing service. It ends up being a complete failure as a commercial product. Um, but the person who developed the CTT ends up getting hired by ASTD, and that's the base. And she really lifted almost, it, it's very closely aligned with what they have for the um, CPLP. It turns out that all aligns with the CSTD credential, the Certified Training and Development Professional, which is the credential that I have. Um, I got it. They have a grandfathering clause. I got a, uh, a senior practitioner route, but I've actually worked on developing that, which is a really fun thing. So you're seeing a lot of things that the profession starting to fill in. Um, ACT, it's not that they hadn't defined the field, but now they publish as a book in the 2000s. We see more um, publications on human resource development. We see the e-learning standard SCORM, which is the first one that allows for interoperability. So you can, and that was always a problem with e-learning. You develop it under one authoring tool, you were stuck with that authoring tool, you couldn't port it. Now all of a sudden e-learning is portable. That's a huge development in the field. Um, we see more certifications launching. There's a product called Adobe Breeze that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. Um, it later became known as Adobe Connect and it was considered to be a live virtual classroom product, but that's not what it was developed for. It was developed actually to do basically speak aloud um, recorded PowerPoint presentations. And they brought it out the same week at a company called RoboHelp, um, which was based on Blue Sky, excuse me, Blue Sky Software, which had the number one help authoring tool called RoboHelp. They came up with RoboPresenter, which is the exact same thing. They announced at the same conference, it was the Online Learning 2001 conference. I remember it well because I got a steak dinner out of it and, um, and a free license. And then a week later, Adobe, um, Macromedia, which is now Adobe, buys out um, Blue, um, Blue Sky Software oh. so that there is no competition for Robo, um, for Adobe Breeze. Yeah, they so just a side, side comment here. Yeah. Um, keep that... Well, go ahead and say what you're going to say, and I'll, I'll add to it. No, no, add to it. It's okay. So, uh, L the president of AECT, or the director of AECT, I should say, because David Wise is the president. So, Ellen Wagner was at Necromedia, and she oh, yeah. wrote, wrote to me on an email, and she says, I want to test this new tool we just bought out, you know, in 2001 or two, whatever it was, and it's called Breeze, and, you know, I'd like to experiment with you. And so, yeah, so I experimented with Adobe Bree, well, Macromedia Breeze, and then Adobe bought them and changed the name to Adobe Connect. And yeah. so we had an article, the title of the article is Life is a Breeze. And during that, they changed the title of the, the software. So we had to change our title of our paper to Life is Adobe Connect Pro. It didn't work as well as Life is a Breeze. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it was interesting because there was they had a little quirk with that product. Yeah. They wanted you to do the recordings, but they didn't want you to have the recordings look on your local computer, they wanted you to always have to go to their server. Yes. Um, that part wasn't so popular. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, Adobe Breeze, or later Adobe Connect, became my go-to virtual classroom. It was never really designed to be a virtual classroom product, but that's really where it excelled and where the market really liked it. Um, and it was my favorite one until Zoom came out, to be honest. And as soon as Zoom been, came out, it was like, bye-bye, yeah. your, your yeah. history. I can that's see that it was the next generation. You can definitely that's what see happened. It. That's what and then we see the rise. Also, in the two thousands, we see the rise of all of the different enterprise systems. So, course management systems, learning management systems, content management systems, and learning content management systems. And it's another day to define all of those. Um, there's one last thing that I didn't mention here. When the decade begins, in terms of e-learning and the corporate market, it was about it was less than ten percent of all corporate training. And that was measured by Training Magazine. And they used to ask, do you use e-learning? And so if you use it, you would be credited. And about half of the companies used it. They changed the question to what site percentage of your training portfolio is this? And all of a sudden the numbers went from like 50% or close to it to like 8%. And, but they went up and by the end of the decade, technology-based training is at about 42, 43% of the, uh, training portfolio. And until the pandemic, it was pretty stable there. We don't, we see a similar rise in e-learning in higher ed, but that happens in the next decade. Um, and that's in the 2010s. And you see, there's not as much development, at least from my perspective, you see MOOCs, you see a lot of organizations rebranding themselves, um, Articulate shows up on um, the XAPI um, standard, which is supposed to be the replace SCORM that, and that's, it's much more than that. Um, that's a really exciting development. I don't know that it's wi as widely used as it might be, but um, it's cool. What you really see is that you see the huge growth in um, enrollments in higher ed um, in e-learning courses, even not just in the e-learning only programs, but even just for regular, you know, face-to-face -face undergraduate students, they're taking one, two, three courses online as, because it's just easier to get in. Um, there's more convenience for those courses. And then towards the very end, we're starting to see the beginning of the return from performance to skills. Um, so that so brings me, yeah. You, you tell them what SCORM is. All right? So it stands for Shareable Object Reference Model. Yes, it's not a standard, it's a reference model, as I've been corrected a thousand times. What, what was the C in Shareable something object? Courseware. Content, courseware uh, object, object Reference Model. Course, uh, yeah, Courseware Object Reference Model. Trying to create inter interoperable content, I guess. To move yeah, it's the idea is that you can, it sends information so technically like, as I understand it, and I'm no expert, um, it tracks performance of students. So, you know, depending on how good your testing is, you can diagnose problems with students. Um, more likely, it's just about record keeping and making sure students get record, um, you know, so credited for completing units. I was working with the Army Research Institute in the Department of Defense at the time, and they talked the perfect e-scorm. <laughs> uh, if you look at Saul's chart here and you go back in time, you can pick a pocket, any one of these pockets, and you can say, the students in our discipline, IST, would be interning doing this back in the 50s. They'd be interning doing this in the 60s. So in the in the early 2000s, people went to, I, I got a bunch of former students, internships at Macromedia. You know, that's the, that's there was a, a lot of need to do some research on, on the tools. Um, and, and the same in our business school. There are a lot of, uh, our business school e-learning program took off and they needed some research and evaluation done. And so it just, it ebbs and flows where what people yeah. are doing, you know, you can't predict what you're gonna get for a job once you get your degree or what internship you're gonna have when you enroll in the program. Just things come up and that's what we do. That's a B of Skinner quote, by the way. Things come up, that's what we do. Um, Anyways, yeah. <laughs> but no, but it's, it's true. And I think the other thing is, is that one thing that's never been a really serious problem in this field, except when there was some offshoring in the early 2000s, um, employment's been, job prospects are really good. Um, they're super right now, but um, yep. they're always been really good. Even in the yep. worst of times, mo like most of our students have always found jobs. 
Yep, we're getting to that week 14 and 15 in here. And we've got some research I've done with one of my former students in LinkedIn and Twitter postings of jobs. Just incredible, the, the, the plethora of jobs today. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, the fact that Jennifer found a job within like 15 days of graduation or applying, you know, right, Jennifer? I mean, it's just- Well, she's good, that's why. Well, yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, in higher ed, no less, because we're, we're training our students you're probably not going to get a job in higher ed. So um, what's your other option? So do you have any more slides or should we go back to Q&A? We can go back to Q&A. What, what do you have for your next slide? I'm curious. Oh, I just had the answer. So, uh, but I've answered these. The answers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so ed tech came first. Yeah. Plato was the first one. It was written by Michael um, Allen, who also created Authorware. Um, and for the first probably 30 years of e-learning, Michael Allen is the dominant name in authoring tools. Right. 35 years on the Kirkpatrick dissertation, right. the Ontario, nobody guesses yeah. the Canadians. Um, I had that, I had that. And um, this, and then because they were called NSPI at the time, but if you said ISPI, you kind of get credit. Yeah. Anyway, so that's all I got in terms of slides. What was the Tim Horton slide? Oh, I was, I was told I was gonna talk about my career, so. I have a double, double career, industry and academe and communication, uh, professional communication and training and development. We've talked about your career indirectly all throughout. Oh, yeah. So uh, Shai Ying had a question of, well, yeah. she posted something here for the question mark. Shai Ying, would you, um, I forget what it was. Uh, that's not my question. So you want somebody's to question is how much can organizational culture affect performance yeah. with this fall under society level? Um, oh, I, I, I try to avoid consulting gigs with one organization because they're nuts. Um, and I didn't believe it. I had students that work with these people are nuts. I got a consulting gig with them and they, I said, they said, don't work with them. They're, they're, they're nuts. And I was like, there's no way they could be nuts on this assignment they managed to find a way to be like psychotic and nuts. Um, so there was something about, and then they got listed as one of the top 10 places to work in the country. I do not understand them. Um, someone they got paid off, but um, yeah, but it's usually at the organization level. Um, and now this is like a division of a larger organization. The larger organization has its own problems, but not these. So there's something unique to this particular division. So it depends on where, what the problems are and where they are. And usually you can tell, like if you go inside this one group and they all act weird, I mean, and I know these are really super technical terms and really, really polite, um, which they're not, um, or you go, and you go outside the organization and you don't see them, then you would say, yeah, um, it's probably, so you have to localize where that the problem is. Um, and that's where you would look at it. It's very rarely as a society, although society influences it. It certainly defines some of the, the, the broader values. Um, but even with society, um, that alone will probably not make a, an organization, that alone will not completely con create the culture. It has a lot to do with also what they do, who founded it, what values guide the work they do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm more of an occupational culture expert than an organizational culture expert. Nobody else looks at occupational culture. That's why I kind of like it. Um, but, organ, I, but I do know enough about organizational culture. It's that each organization, I mean, each sub-organization, like even in a university, some departments are more functional than others. Um, and that's a combination of factors, but they usually have to do with the people in the organization. Linda, your question. That was my question. Oh, that was yours. Okay. That was your question. Congratulations. Thank you. You have a follow-up, Linda. Anything else? Um, other than when you talk about society, you're, you're talking about the society outside the organization? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to be honest. I don't, I mean, that was Roger Kaufman's, and I think it, it's noble to mention that. Um, Fixing society is not the easiest thing. And that's why I always thought it was a really good as a theoretical construct, as a practical one. Um, it's really, really hard. I mean, you know, we always hear about one person can have impact, but it's only if everybody other, like, you know, in the US, so it'd be 328,999,999 people are willing to go there with you. Fewer people have to go along up here in Canada. Um, but the, I mean, it, it, changing a society is not easy. 
Linda, um, tell, tell them where you work. Oh, I work in, and, and by the way, talk about crazy um, societies. <laughs> I work in Quebec. I don't know how much you know about um, the province of Quebec. Um, they always say Quebec is a very interesting place because a lot of people think, you know, they come to Montreal and they hear English and they hear French and they assume it's a bilingual city. Number one mistake, never ever say Montreal is a bilingual city. Montreal is a French city where they will tolerate, usually with their noses held like this, you're speaking English. Um, and to give you an idea, there's a bill before the uh, provincial legislature to further restrict my rights as an English speaking person who was not born in Canada, much less educated here. Um, so when it comes, and because they're very, very sensitive being the only province where there's a majority population that speaks French and where French is the language of everyday life and they're scared of losing that. So they go to extremes. In fact, the ex not to go into, Quebec history is fascinating, um, but they, voted, there have been three times they tried to separate. Once during colonial period in 1837, there was a revolution. Um, things were latent until the early 1970s. Then there were a couple of bombings. Then they had a referendum that didn't, that went really badly. And then the Canadian, the rest of the Canada called ROC pissed off Quebec in early 1990, to which they said, we're going to hold another referendum. And they lost by like, a very, like, like it was at like point, it was in decimal points, how much, how close the election was. Um, but people do not want a third referendum here, but it drives everything, including the housing prices. Because if you never know if you're going to, if you're, if you never don't know which country your home is really in, how much are you going to invest in it? So we have political stability and home prices have been rising, thank God, because my home is paid, is not paid for. Um, and I, I make money off of the, of the rise. Um, but otherwise, it's actually quite left. Um, it's one of the most progressive provinces when you take all of those other issues out. So it's a really fascinating place um, politically. I never get bored being here. I don't. I never get bored in my job. I never get bored living in this province. Um, they always astound me. Sometimes, many times, positively. Every now and then, it's like, oh my god, what are they doing? Um, but yeah, it's a good place. And they taught me lots several of times. Concordia is a, is a really good place, and McGill is too. And Mon Montreal is just. Yeah, Montreal is a beautiful city. It's if you how many people have they ever been to Montreal besides Jennifer and Kurt? Oh, Prissa. What did you think of it, Prissa? Oh, you're muted. You're Prisa. muted. We can't yeah, I was muted. Sorry. Um, I was 10 when I went, so, uh, so I, I don't remember that much. Uh, well, but it was a family back. vacation. Yeah, I, I do. I've heard a lot of great things. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really cool place. It's changed in the past 15 years, Prisca. It, I was 10 a long time before that. So I'm sure it's even more different than when I was there. Yeah, so, all 12 years ago. Um, so Linda, tell, tell uh, Saul where you work. Well, I work for Anthem. I don't know if you've heard of Anthem Blue Cross hey, Blue Shield. Oh yeah, yeah. But when, we, when I was a kid, we had Blue Cross Blue Shield yeah. insurance. That's what um, my bills. They're actually uh, changing their name uh, Anthem Again? name is going away to, and it's going to be Elevance. What happened Weird. to Blue Cross Blue Shield? I always like that name. Well, it's going to stay Blue Cross Blue Shield, but the the Anthem is going away. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, we have the Anthem at Indiana yeah. University, so we're going to have Elevance. Which yes. Really, I, I won't say that it sounds stupid, but um, okay. I think I think it sounds like a drug or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. Scott, you have a question before we go. You have to unmute, Scott. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just kind of wondered, you know, my background is in K-12, and I know, you know most of us come from different disciplines, but I was wondering if you could kind of note any particular, like, skill sets or mindsets that would set somebody apart from, say, corporate versus the nonprofit world or higher ed or K-12, through like any kind of uh, stark differences between any of them? Yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting because one of the things I think that a lot of people don't realize, they think, you know, you say education is like one monolith and each of the different major sectors is its own monolith with its own governance. And I think one of the things that's challenging about the K-12 system is on every other system, um, every other sector, like higher ed, you get hired actually for your expertise as in your subject area. In K-12, 
it's like one of the only parts of education, and I'm going to put one minor caveat in there, where you're primarily hired for your teaching skill, which is what one of the things that really sets it apart. And you're also the only place where teaching is licensed. Every place else, you know, anybody like says I'm a teacher can be a teacher. You can't in the K-12. You can't at least you can't make a long-term career that way unless there's a desperate shortage and they're making some kind of uh, exception for you. So I'd say that's the beginning. Um, curriculum is done really, really different in the K-12 because it's, I mean, you, you, you can turn the news and it's not a matter of what your politics are. It's even reading and writing is a political act, you know, with the way they set curriculum um, up. And it's expected that every teacher will follow that curriculum, which is really different. Like in higher ed, we have academic freedom. I can teach whatever I want. In theory, I'm supposed to have some resemblance. It, it of course has to have some resemblance to the uh, course description in the catalog. But if, as long as I can make the case, I'll get away with it. Um, K-12, you fail to teach. And by the way, if you fail to teach, your kids are taking a test at the end of the year and you're held accountable for their results, depending on which school board, your school system you're working in. And they call them school boards up here, which is why I slipped for a second. Um, yeah, that's what we call them. And so it's, it's a much more regulated space. Um, I think the good news is, is that you've got a better quality of teaching um, in K-12. I think the sad thing is, is that they don't, from what I can tell, I, I don't work in the, that part of the area. They don't give you as much freedom to do your work the way you should be have to do your work. Um, I, I mean, I still think teachers are doing some really creative things, but there's a lot of regulation about what you can do, what textbook you can use and so forth. And I get it, you know, when you have to buy 100,000 textbooks, it's easier to buy them all the same one because you can get a really great price on them than when every teacher gets to just pick their own textbook. Um, so, I mean, that in terms of technology, um, that's been interesting because higher ed didn't use all the technology it had before the pandemic, but whether they realized it or not, they were totally ready for it. Um, and when they weren't ready was the skills problem. K-12 had, they were not as ready. Um, and because they're designed primarily and almost exclusively for face-to-face -face teaching, um, or I've been told this is face-to-face, -face, I'm supposed to use in-person, I apologize. So in-person <laughs> teaching. And um, there are a lot of issues too, because they serve a much broader audience. Um, a broader public and so access to equipment while it's an issue in a public um, higher education institution it's a more acute issue in a k-12 system because students don't have to, there's nobody holding a gun to your head and say you're going to go to jail if you don't show up in school k-12 up to age 16 someone is saying you either show up to school or someone's going to jail you your parents maybe all of you um, but so you have to make sure that those students have that and then of course checking on a lot of those students because a lot of them live on the margins was more of, it's not that we didn't have students on the margins here, but it was more of a challenge, um, I think, for the K-12. So, I, I mean, I think you, you deal with a very, very different set of governance, a different set of hiring requirements, a different set of um, curriculum management, and a different technology um, reality. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yeah, no, it definitely world. did, because, you know, I've been kind of, you know, I know people in, you know, medical sales device, nonprofit world, et cetera. And you know, one thing that I saw that was specific to K twelve was they're very beholden to, like you said, the school boards, and it's really volatile year to year whether parents are gonna you know have a fit about this or that. And you know, like you said, you're much more restricted. And limited. One of the things that I think different about the American system, the Canadian system, that I've come to realize, Canadian system is run by the province or the state, um, whereas you have local school boards in every jurisdiction in the US. And they have some they have some control over the schooling, which really doesn't happen here. The Minister of Education for each of the provinces is almost like a czar of education. And they just they decree things like and it was very interesting. Parents were just as unhappy about kids going back to school here as they were. I mean, there were just as much angst as it was in the States during the um, COVID. But they said they wanted kids out of the house. Uh, and that was the, the, the premier of the province. The minister said they're all leaving. They're all going to school. And the teachers were like, no, you need this. You need that. It's like, shut up. We're not listening to you. And they just all went to the, they, the schools were open. Um, sometimes they were masked, sometimes not masked, um, depending on the mood of the day. And they just 
and they're they've done away with all the school board local school boards here they're called they're like advisory committees and so they have no control over the masking at all but that's also partly because we have complete universal public health so the state will just make all the decisions because ultimately if they make a bad choice we all pay for it because um it's our tax dollars that are paying for the healthcare system. So Kenway or Sunmei, um, I know Sunmei had a problem with the internet connection in Palo Alto, where she's at, she works for Stanford, um, and oh, she's my wow. TA, and she's my TA in this class. And today the internet's down throughout the whole district. Do either one of you have a final question for Saul? Because we've we've about run out of time. Sunmei or Kenway? Sumei might not be able to because she's on his phone. Sumei, yeah, I noticed ahead. that. I hope you left uh, your iPhone. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sumi. Uh, nice to meet you. And nice thank you for your time. Actually, I had a really hard time to yeah, listen to you. That's because my internet just came back right now, 10 oh, minutes ago. Thing. Yeah. And then just to listen and and then everyone asked really good questions. So I just to trying to understand everything. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So Kyung Wei, you want to unmute and just say hi if you're with us here. I'm not sure if you Kyung Wei? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfectly. Oh, perfect. I finally it works. Yeah, my my sometimes when I when I connect my um monitors, the, the mic doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for sharing. It, it really uh, helps a lot. And the uh, the terms between IT and the HPT, uh, Dr. Bonk shared some readings in, I think it's week two in this semester. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the readings talking about the terms, how, how the terms evolving in, in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's oh, really yeah. helpful. It sure. might be Bob Reeser's chapter in the yeah. Dempsey book. Uh, Ken Wei yeah. is a science education major, oh, right? Terrific. You're a PhD student in, in science ed, right? Yes. Yeah. Terrific. So, so that's, we've gotten around to everybody. I'm glad we had a chance to. We've kept you a little longer than I promised. I said I would put you on the payroll and the retirement plan at Indiana. Um, I once gave a talk in Ohio when it was put on the retirement plan. I still get notices of the state retirement plan for Ohio, even though I have nothing in the system anymore. They actually put money in for doing one talk. Um, <laughs> wow. You never know. Um, but yeah, it was kind of weird. But um, anyways, so I think I think Saul deserves a real nice a round of applause for everybody because he not only inspired us with his career notes, but the content that he was able to um, pre present to all of us really was an override for a number of weeks of the course. It really, the assembly of things that you did here, especially the timeline, I'm glad we went back to the timeline because timelines help people who like to have knowledge explicated and structured in some way. So you can see what you've been reading. They've been reading all these articles, but now in a timeline, you can see what you've been reading and how the field has evolved. And I didn't speak on that. I haven't lectured on it or talked on it. So it was really, really good to reinforce what they have read and what they're going to read right. this week in week 12. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Happy reading, everybody. My and pleasure. So we can hang around for oh, a yeah, second. absolutely. We'll absolutely. Chat with you. I'm going to put this up to the cloud, stop the recording, and I'll.